You were not meant to be a slave to the grind. You were not meant to trade your life force for money. You can escape gravity. You can unlock your life. You got this. Let's go. Hello and welcome to Unlock Your Life. This is Jennings Smith, your host. Today I want to start off with a story of when I was a kid. My dad took us camping, the whole family, myself, my mom, my three sisters, and we went to North Carolina. And apparently some distant relative of his had this little mountain cabin up in North Carolina. And I think it was kind of up by Lake Lure, if you're familiar with North Carolina. And he was going to spend the night at the cabin because, you know, we did not have a whole lot of money growing up. (laughs) And my dad had a free place to stay in the mountains and it was going to be great. So we drive up there and... I mean, this cabin looks abandoned. It looks like nobody's been inside of it in 20 years. It's locked up. We can't get in. I think this was in the days before cell phones. Maybe my dad had a car phone, but it probably didn't work up in the mountains. So he can't get a hold of his great, great cousin, aunts or whoever owned this property. And there's also a tree that has fallen across the driveway to the house. So... Needless to say, it's a little bit sketchy, but my dad, you know, instead of being like, let's get a hotel, he is undeterred and he says, we're going to make this work. He probably did not honestly have the money for the hotel at the time. So he decides he's going to park in the driveway and he has a Econoline van. He's got a white Econoline van, 1980 something. And in the back, they have this foam rubber mattress. And so he decides that He and my mom and my baby sister, Lydia, are going to sleep in the back. My older sister, Crystal, is going to sleep on the bench seat. And lucky, lucky, Irene and myself, my sister that's two years younger than me, we're going to sleep on the porch of this broken down house on the side of the mountain in the elements. Well, we're on the porch. So we get out the sleeping bags and he gets us set up on this little tiny porch. I mean, it, it couldn't be bigger than... 10 by 10. So we lay our sleeping bags out. It's dark and we all kind of go to bed. Well, a storm blows up and it is cold. And I mean, the wind's going and I mean, not that cold because it's summertime, but it's raining, lightning, generally scary. (laughs) And I wake up and I'm not sure how old I was, probably 10. I don't know, but I wake up and I'm out of my sleeping bag. The sleeping bag is unzipped. The zippers come undone. And I cannot figure out how to get back in this sleeping bag or zip it up. And I'm freezing. And I'm working the zipper, working the zipper. And can't get the thing lined up. And eventually, I don't know how long it had been. But eventually, I just sort of give up on getting this sleeping bag enclosed around me and getting back into it and I'm very very frustrated and I'm very emotional and I kind of let out this like half sigh half yell half cry like groan (laughs) of disappointment and regret and I'm just just so beaten by this stupid sleeping bag and zipper and then my dad who's down below in the van you know This is such a loud moan, groan, cry. He thinks I'm being attacked by a bear. So he wakes up, you know, he shines a flashlight off there and he's like, what's going on? What's going on? Are you okay? And I'm like, I can't find my sleeping bag. I can't zip my sleeping bag up. And he starts, um, I think he started laughing at that point, but he found a, a flashlight. He woke up my sister. She shined the flashlight. And very quickly, once I had the light on there, I was able to get the sleeping bag put together, got in the sleeping bag, nice and warm, and fell asleep. And the rest is history. <laughs> Other than the embarrassing story that my family still makes fun of me about for crying and moaning about not being able to figure out a sleeping bag, letting a sleeping bag beat me. But why am I talking about this? Well, And I'm actually like laughing at myself telling this story, but talking about our minds, right? How powerful our minds are. And in that scenario, there are two examples. One, you've got 
Little Jennings, me, who is completely overwhelmed, completely frustrated, lets his emotions take hold of him, has a mental breakdown, you know, is crying and giving up completely over something so foolish, so, so little, so stupid, right? It's summertime. I'm not going to die. You know, it's a little bit of rain and I'm out there losing it over not being able to zip up my sleeping bag, right? And then my dad, you know, his gut reaction is, oh my gosh, a bear has attacked my kids. A tree fell on the porch and smashed them. Like he thinks that worst case scenario has happened, right? That his children or his son, his big manly son is in serious trouble. And that wasn't the case, right? So neither scenario was true, but both of our brains were pushing us immediately to that. What is the threat? What is this worst case scenario? And we see that in business, right? So we had a property that we bought and it was purchased with kind of a a very unique loan where they were going to roll all the mortgage payments into the mortgage, right? The first year of mortgage payments into the mortgage and it was going to be great and it was going to cash flow because it was distressed. So we were going to be able to turn around. We're going to have all this extra cash flow because we weren't paying the mortgage, get these renovations done. And it was just going to be a slam dunk home run deal. It was in a great area and it was going to be a home run. So we got going on it and a couple things went wrong. So one, we bought it right as school was already in session. And this was sort of in a college area and we didn't lease up very much in the fall. And in the winter, because that's not the leasing season for college towns. They pretty much lease in the spring and the summer and in and, and the fall. And like that whole late fall, winter, early spring is dead. So that was hurting us. Secondly, this lender had a lot of fees associated with it that we really were not totally cognizant of, where they had a construction management fee in there that no other bank had charged us. And they also had like a lending management fee of $750 a month and another $1,500 a month for this construction management fee. So there was another $2,250 a month that we hadn't really underwritten, honestly. We hadn't been charged it before. I mean, it must have been buried somewhere in the fine print of the loan docs, but we did not see it. And then right before closing, they, they said, well, you know, because of this and this and this, we really can't do a year's worth of loan payments. We can only do nine and a half months or 10 months for some reason. And so there was another kind of kick. And then we start to run out of money on the renovations, right? The renovations are costing more than we think. They're a bigger deal. And then the bank's not as forthcoming with the renovation draws. And then COVID and inflation and construction prices are just going crazy. And all these things are coming together and making this project very, very difficult. Right. And so I started to freak out. I started to freak out a little bit, just like with the sleeping bag. I started to go to worst case scenario, started thinking, oh, wow, what if we lose this property? What if we lose investors money? What if we default on this loan? Like, I mean, just going immediately to the nuclear option. And it wasn't really to that point yet by any means, but that was sort of like the way that my brain initially went. Okay. So remember that because we're going to come back to that. I have a two and a half year old daughter. She is great. Love her, but she is two and a half years old. And so if she gets hurt or if she doesn't have her way or she has to eat something that she doesn't want to eat, she has a meltdown. And if you've ever had a two year old or been around a two year old, you know that They have these meltdowns, just crying, screaming, and there really is no consoling them. It's really difficult to get them to snap out of it. The reason being is they're using their amygdala, like their core brain, which is where your fight or flight comes from and and your emotional responses, your lizard brain, if people have called it that, maybe you've heard that term, where You need this thing and and those protect you, but they're not great for making cognitive decisions, right? 
Like, let's say the two-year-old drops the toy in the mud and it gets all dirty and you rinse it off and give it back to them and they're still crying, right? They're still screaming. They're still upset. Well, why? You know, logically, the problem is solved. The problem is fixed. They got their toy back. It's cleaned up. No big deal. And yet they're going on and on and on in this downward spiral because they're not processing that logically. They're processing that with their lizard brain, with their emotional responses, and and that's it. And so what I decided to, or I read about this, uh, um, how do you snap a kid out of this? How do you change that? And what you do is you ask the child to take action. So what I've started to do is I'll say, Sophie, touch your nose. And she won't want to do it. Touch your nose. Okay. Cover your eyes. All right. Wiggle your ears. Can you pat your head? And I'll give her a couple of commands. And what I'm trying to do is like, jostle her out of that processing in the um, amygdala and activate her prefrontal cortex. I'm trying to help her use her logical brain and think, oh, wait a minute. He's asking me to touch my nose. How do I touch my nose? Okay, boom. She does it. All of a sudden, she's changing the part of the brain she's using. And it's pretty magical because it works. Like they kind of like get composure and get control of themselves and stop the tantrum. So if you have kids, there you go. Freebie hack on how to get out of a tantrum there. But that's kind of where I was going with this project was just letting this emotions spin me out of control instead of thinking like, okay, I need to touch my nose. I need to touch my ears. Like I need to logically process what's my next step of action. What do I need to do? And what's the solution instead of just being bound up by emotions. And so that's what we did. Yaden and I dug into the numbers. We figured out what was going wrong and we figured out that this was going off track and here's why and what we could do about it. And so we did, we figured it out. I mean, one, we needed to do a cash injection. So we, we figured that out, got that done. Secondly, we redid the budgets and got them resubmitted. We worked with the bank. The bank released the money faster. We got the renovations back on track and going. We pushed on the leasing, you know, time elapsed, right? The spring came in. It was a better leasing season. We pushed the occupancy up and up and up and started to turn that thing around. And yet we still were looking at the timeline of our payments were going to be jumping way up, right? Because it wasn't going to be interest only anymore. And those payments weren't going to be escrowed, right? Because they had loaned us the first 10 months of payments. And that time was going to be coming nigh. And so we had to make a tough decision because we were going to refinance this building and hold it long term. It was a good property, still is a good property, but we weren't going to be able to get it stabilized enough to refinance it and return all the investors capital, which was kind of the model that we had pitched the investors on that we would stabilize this thing, refinance it, and then hold it for, you know, five to 10 years, then sell it off. So we decided hey, we're not going to be able to get these renovations done that fast. We're not going to be able to fill it up that fast. These payments are going to go up really high. You know what, guys? We took a bad loan. We we shouldn't have worked with this lender. And so we need to sell this property because it is a great property. The market is doing very, very well. It's in a good area. We have made it significantly better than when we bought it. And so let's see what happens. And That was another logical decision that we had to just go through. What is the pros and cons? What should we do here? And we put it on the market. And within a week, we got a phenomenal offer, two or three offers, actually, at a price where we were going to exceed the pro forma that we had promised our investors, beat the returns that we had said we would get them without taking on any more construction risk and without continuing to struggle along with this property. So yes, we're not going to be able to refinance it and hold it, but we're all going to make a really, really good profit. And the firm that is buying it, they put it under contract. They put money down hard day one, quite a bit of money, very strong buyer out of New York and hedge fund type family office. And uh, it worked out great. And all of that mental anguish that I had had, all that freaking out and worry about 
this might happen and, and this could happen and all the imaginary horribles, they never came to pass, right? That bear never ate me. The tree never fell on me. Those things did not occur. And that is why we have to control those emotions with our base level brain and our emotional brain because it's there to protect us, right? It's there to help you from getting killed, from falling off the cliff, from getting eaten by the mountain lion. But most of the time, that threat is not real anymore, right? In a modern society, most of the time, you're not about to be killed. And that's what it feels like, though. It's hard for our brain to delineate between those emotions. And so, what is the solution, right? You're thinking, well, Jennings, that all worked out great for you. All's well, it ends well. But I'm in the thick of it right now. I've got something that's facing me that's difficult and it's hard to feel that way. And guys, I know. I know. And I have other problems that I'm working through right now, you know, in real time. We all do. As entrepreneurs, you start doing enough stuff like you're going to have problems. And we want problems, right? New problems equals new solutions equals growth. And it's going in the right direction. If you don't have any problems, you're not doing anything. <laughs> and trust me, then you'll have problems for not doing anything. The cost of not taking any risks is much greater than the cost of taking risks. But the solution that I have found, what always makes me feel better, and maybe not immediately, but consistently, what the only thing that makes me feel better is taking that action, right? Just like me telling my daughter, touch your nose, touch your ears, touch your head, jump up and down. Like working on something, working on the problem. Instead of sitting there bound up by fear, bound up by all the things that possibly could or would or might happen, what can we do now? How can we affect this outcome right now? What decisions do we need to make and what actions can we take? And that quantifying it, doing a thought audit, writing down how am I feeling, writing down all the options. What can we do? Should we sell it? Should we refinance it? How can we lower the renovation? Can we talk to the bank? Do we need to raise more money? Do we need to put more money in as an investors or as the general partners? Like all these different options. You always have options. You always have a choice. You always have something that you can do to affect or change the outcome of what you're facing. And that most often is where the best solution evolves from. And it definitely makes you feel better. It's a tangible way that I know, at least for me, works to overcome that, that fear and anxiety and work towards it. Now, I, I'm not saying it's immediate, but it definitely is a step in the right direction. So think about that. How can you activate your prefrontal cortex, your logical thinking, advanced brain versus dwelling and living in that reptilian baser level? emotion and fear driven brain and thought process. You've got to elevate out of that and elevate into the magical, powerful you that has good ideas, that has solutions, that can figure this out, that isn't going to get beaten. And that's where the solutions lie. That's how you can unlock your life and unlock any situation. So if you're feeling this way with these fears and doubts and imaginary horribles, stop, activate that prefrontal cortex, start thinking logically, start taking action, start feeling better and unlock your life. That's all I got for you today, guys. I'll see you next week. I appreciate you being here. If you like the show, leave me a review, shoot me a message. If you're interested in multifamily, jump on my Facebook group, My First Million in Multifamily. If you're interested in just business and general life, then follow me here. Listen to me here. I'd love to interact with you, start building a relationship with you and getting to know you. And I appreciate the listens. I appreciate the reviews, appreciate the follows and, and everybody telling their friends. So thank you guys. Talk soon. Peace. This is the podcast factory.com.